Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan, and I hope to bring you up a level in a variety of subjects today. And also for the XRP holder, I think I have a little bit of trivia that you most likely, I would guess, 95% of the holders have never heard of. But first, Galgatron. Well, Galgatron does it like no other. The official blog by the mysterious writer and Twitter extraordinaire who loves to be hated, but everybody loves, writes about the smart contracts flare network. And I think every holder of XRP needs to read this. And if you don't own XRP, well, then maybe it's even more important that you also read this. I'm going to read only four lines here. And I think then I will put the link in the description below. It goes like this, Flare. This is the best thing to happen to XRP ever. I repeat, this is the best thing to happen to XRP ever. This is a great article, Galgatron. Thank you so much for all your work. It really helps make this DeFi project very clear. And then this is George Ball. He was born in 1938. He's the former president of E.F. Hutton, former CEO of Prudential. He's built his career around investment banking and there's a Reuters video that's been making the rounds since Saturday. It's coming, of course, from someone who has been in a very traditional world of finance. And at the age of 82, his answer to the question of what assets should investors get into, say outside of equities, is very surprising. And I do want to also put to rest a little bit about when he talks about after Labor Day. Have a just a quick listen to this portion. Uh, first thing to put their money, uh, there are no yields today. And so Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency becomes a very attractive uh, either long term, I want to make a, a, a safe uh, haven for my money, or a short term speculative bet. Uh, and I think it, it's a, a good. I think it's where many people will turn uh, after Labor Day. Then. So that's where many people are going to turn after Labor Day. Yeah, I think that the fact that he's talking about there's no yields today, and this is a safe haven is quite interesting. Now, the after day labor or the after Labor Day comment. Summertime, August in particular, is thought of as a very quiet month for traders. And it is traditional that traders get back to trading after Labor Day, which is an American holiday that's falling on September 7th. So there's nothing more than he's just coming from the traditional world and that's what has been said for years and years in that trading world. And now we look at something about web traffic on the crypto exchanges. This is for the month of July. And according to Block Research, which is pretty credible, uh, three exchanges make up 49% of web traffic. Can you believe that? And Binance is leading with 22%, followed by Coinbase and BitMEX, 20.3% and 6.2% respectively. It's going to be interesting to see if BitMEX can hold on to that because this is an announcement from Friday where they're gonna start doing their ID checks, basically the mandatory KYC. And I think they anticipate a lot of people bailing on them as they did with Poloniex. And you can, See, for the people who do complete the verification, they're going to give some sizable prizes. <laughs> so it sounds like that they're bribing those people to stay on. All right, in the Manila Standard today, the Singapore-based managing director of Ripple, that's, um, he is the uh, in the Asian region, Pacific Asian region, this is Calvin Lee. And he was in an interview via email and he used to work for MasterCard. And now he is in the region that has more than half of Ripple's customers. Yeah, according to the article, 50, more than 50% hail from the Asian Pacific region. And the Philippines really stands out 
because this on-demand liquidity corridor, which is very live with XRP being utilized, is a $34 billion remittance corridor. And in the article, it's highlighting Azimo that is using the digital asset XRP and ODL reduces their cost by 30 to 50%. And the Philippines, they are way ahead of many countries when it comes to the unbanked and they've done it by introducing smart wallets. This is the central bank Facebook page and you can see that they are pushing their e-payment transactions and they are also very active in opening new remittance corridors to other countries in the region and they have this national retail payment system it's interoperable it's secure it's efficient it's very 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 much like the fed now instant payments is trying to launch uh, and achieve by 2023 in the u.s but even in the fed now they don't have a solution for the unbanked, that was addressed in that video that I covered yesterday. And I just, I found it very surprising. They don't have that solution figured out yet. Well, this is the Central Bank of Philippines and they have really figured it out. I'm gonna just play a short portion of this so you can see how interoperable it is with the banks and money transmitters all connected instantly. What should you do when you need to pay someone? Transfer funds or send cash to anyone in the Philippines immediately. Easy. You InstaPay. As part of the national retail payment system of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, InstaPay is the fastest way to move money in the Philippines that is safe, affordable, and reliable. InstaPay interconnects banks and electronic money issuers nationwide. Napakabilis at maaasahan ang InstaPay. Yeah, this is is it's uh it's great and that really provides those new corridors that are going to go live a lot of potential. This is like Mexico a really big corridor to keep your eye on. And then I'm going to introduce someone who is maybe a new name for you. This is uh, Yelena McWilliams, and she is the chairwoman of the FDIC. And she was also, if you remember back in 2019, when Mr. Garlinghouse was a keynote speaker at the 2019 DC FinTech, she too gave a keynote. Now there's a video that's very interesting. It's from August 6th. And she's talking about how if the smaller banks don't get on the bandwagon with new fintech technologies, they're going to go by the wayside, as did blockbusters. Have a listen to this portion. Go back to work. Uh, we've seen digital adoption soar across many industries, but uh, including in the banking space. Is that a big threat to the smaller community banks whose spending on tech has massively lagged for, for obvious reasons because of their size? Uh, what the big banks and fintech companies have, have spent on tech in the last couple of years? That's a great question. And frankly, it's a question that's going to decide the future of community banks in the United States. Uh, in a speech last year in St. Louis, I basically said if the, if the small banks in particular do not adopt new delivery channels that their customers have come to expect from technology companies, they're going to go the way of, of uh, I said, then Blockbuster. Yeah. So this, uh, this, this leading the community banks in Japan, one of those guiding voices is Mr. Kitao, and he is gathering the community banks with strategic investments to create his vision of the fourth mega bank. And he was in an article in the Nikkei Financial, which had everybody just taken by surprise. It was a shocking investment, and he did it in a product for securities, a platform system, with his rival. This is a very public rivalry and it's been going on these hot words back and forth for more than 20 years and it's with his first employer when he got out of university nomura nomura securities and um i think that 
It's so interesting. The article even used the word to describe Mr. Kitao as bushi. Bushi is two kanji. The first kanji means warrior, and the second kanji means the gentleman scholar or samurai. So Mr. Kitao has just been surprising everybody. And there was another big announcement today. He gave away through a uh, joint venture purchase agreement, but 14% of SBI R3 Japan. And I don't know, you know, the Sumitomo Mitsui Financial Group that's going to take this 14% stake, they are the 12th biggest bank in the world by total assets. And I'm trying to put myself in Mr. Kitao's shoes. And for what purpose did he do this? And for what reason? And what's his strategy? What does he have in mind? You know, he always has me thinking very, very hard. And last but not least, there's an article today that talks about a wallet that was set up for a major XRP giveaway to the community back in 2013. And I don't know too much about the actual transfer, but I thought it would be fun to talk about this giveaway that was giving people rewards of XRP uh, back in 2013. 13 and 2000, part of 2014. So what was it? Well, it was for, in the case of Ripple, computing for good. And as you can see, it is no longer active. They have the statement there. And there is a link that unfortunately happens to be dead. But of course, thanks to the Wayback Machine, we can make those dead links go go live again. And this is the page that's basically from February 2014. And what this does, this uh, is a technology that you can connect with the IBM initiative. And it basically utilizes the idle computer's power. And it does so then to create a technical environment where research can be processed. I mean, tons of big data can be processed to solve a lot of problems around the world. And they're still active. They have 42,000 active accounts. They have 147,000 active devices. And in this time frame that we're looking at, you can see that they had given away 87 million XRP. And in terms of the compute time donated, 167 million hours. So it was, I think, um, well, it was very um, helpful because uh, you can see that in the Japanese community, I came across a blog that talks about Bitcoin had plunged to under $600, <laughs> which, which at the time many people were considering moving to Ripple, as this blog says. And one way to get into Ripple was to register on this WCG uh, page so that you could earn free XRP every day. XRP at this time was at three cents. So the Ripple Labs, just so you know, this is uh, the World Community Grid, the WCG. It's still live and it has 5,600 current members. It's ranked fourth in points generated as of August 16th, 2020. And you can even go down and see the average number of points per hour and per calendar day. And yes, you can still join the team. But if you do join the team, your points are going to remain with in the team still. And you can see that uh, it'll take you to different projects that you can elect to contribute your computing power to the open uh, pandemic, the Africa rainfall, AIDS, mapping cancer markers, etc. So I think this is probably something a lot of XRP holders are unaware of, but uh, the IBM 
corporate social responsibility initiative is still very much alive. And if you're interested in it, you can go to the Twitter site at WC Grid and you can find out more about it. All right, everybody, where are we going? We are going to the fluff. This is interesting fluff. What do you think this is? Hard to tell, huh? I can give you a hint before I show you the next picture. It's in a park in Shibuya. Yes, they are public restrooms. And yes, they have transparent walls. But when you get up close, you'll see something a little different with this technology. Now, the reason why it has transparent walls is because the public restrooms are open 24 hours a day, as in all the public restrooms are. And there's this country is, is, is you never have to worry about a public restroom because they're everywhere. But it's kind of scary to go into a public restroom at night, right? So they make these public restrooms with transparent walls. But let me show you what happens when you lock the door. Turn off the sound there. So you walk in and watch carefully. The walls go opaque. So you have your privacy. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, what a very, very inventive design. And then I'm going to jump to another bit of uh, fluff because it was really a, made me feel very positive and I wanted to share it with you. Here we are just looking at a book display. Notice the cover. Notice the newspaper article with this picture here. Notice the cover of Newsweek in Japan with this cover here. And what it's all about is what this man has done, Maki Tezuka. He is the owner of uh, about 10 host clubs in Kabukcho. Kabukcho is the adult entertainment area. The host clubs are where the men are working for the entertainment of women. Totally reverse of what you would think, but they're very, very popular and big business here in Japan. But what he's done is this is a really tough time for them. Really tough, really, really tough. I know someone who is working and, and uh, Kabukcho, the nighttime business is pretty much not happening at all. So there is a collection of 300 Tonka poems that he arranged to be published in that book. And more than 70 men who are working those um, clubs have written one of the oldest forms of poetry in Japan. It, bakes, it dates back 1,200 years. And it's done in a little bit of a different way than haiku. Haiku is with three lines, 17 syllables, uh, five, seven, five. But Tonka is much more uh, <laughs> difficult. And it is with 31 syllables. It's a five, seven, five, seven, seven in a single unbroken line. Not that it, it's a single line this way, but it's a single line of thought, if you will. And I'm just so pleased to see that he has taken this step to bring uh, a new source of revenue and also um, giving them a, some creative outlet in a time that's very, very difficult. And they brought this um, expert in the field. She's a sensei, a teacher, Machi Tawawa. 
Tawara, and she also became their judge for the Tonka po poetry readings and the sessions that they hold. And I just, you know, it's just one of these stories where through the really difficult times that everybody is having to endure, some good things come out of it. All right, everybody. Yes, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.